It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! This week, starring Mystery Music Library CEO. Yeah, baby. Woohoo! And thank you, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. Good fade. Hello, everybody. Let me say hello to the gang in the chat room. There you are. All right, let's see. Who do we have here? We've got Cass McKenty, John Pearson, Darren Fletcher, Alan Hall, Bob Gunnerfelt, Linda Cullum, Russell Nolan, Nancy Collell, Mark Stone, the Dirty Country Band, Ray Winch, Debbie Ward, Gloria Covington, Martin Gravel, Rip Wagner, Dean Turner, Terry Shaw, Carl Wurzbach, Vincent Nicotina, Harry Harlow, Darren Moss, uh, Dale Markley, Andre Stepanian, Let's Talk Fishing, uh, Andre Franz, uh, Rick Cabot Podmore, Jai King, is that Jay or Jai? I don't know. We know a Jai who spells it that way. Um, Dave Friedland, Ancient Robots, like that. Jonathan Morse, Dan Weber, Jim Stamper, Wind Chimes Music, KJ Mikol, Jesse J. Peck, Anyway, um, Michael McGraw, hello, everybody. Well, I hope you all had a pleasant weekend. Not much going on, right? <laughs> uh, not going to get into the political stuff, but wow, wow, wow. Um, I was just at the grocery store about an hour and a half ago, and the young man bagging my groceries said, uh, so did you hear they're coming to where we are? Uh, I'm not going to disclose the town I'm in, but... Uh, he said, yeah, they're coming here. Um, I know that people are amassing about, I don't know, I'd say 15 miles from here. Um, crazy, crazy, crazy time in America. And uh, anyway, yeah, I'm not going to comment any more than that. Just stay safe. Um, don't go outside. <laughs> Man, I look really tan today, and uh, I'm not that tan, but, you know, lighting's all the same as normal, but here we are. Um, I got to say, one thing I will say about all this is when I got back from the grocery store, I turned on the, the local news to see what was shaking, because we keep getting all these alerts that, uh, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, you know, lockdown begins at 6 o'clock and then 5 o'clock and then 6 o'clock. I don't know if I should believe L.A. City or L.A. County. Uh, no, no, no. We don't talk actual politics. We don't talk about whether we like the president or not here. That's not the purpose of the show. I was going to give a compliment to a gentleman who is the chief of police for Los Angeles. Uh, his name is Michael Moore, M-I-C-H-E-L, Moore, not the uh, movie guy. Um, and he gave an off-the-cuff speech that was so incredibly good. Seriously, I kept thinking, man, if one of the Kennedys had given this speech, people would have been impressed. Didn't look like he was reading it from a teleprompter. So um, maybe after today's show, go Google um, Michael, M-I-C-H-E-L Moore, uh, Chief of Police Los Angeles, and see if you can find a, you know his speech on YouTube or something. It was... I thought it was great tone, really, really uh, hit the nail, hit many nails on the head, and wow, what a speech. Anyway, so enough of that. Um, today, we're going to be joined momentarily by the Mystery Music Library CEO, and you guys know the rules. Um, several of you, maybe many of you actually know this person, maybe you have stuff signed to uh, his library. Maybe you've hung out with him at the road rally, um, but keep a lid on it. Uh, we've been dealing with a, a troll issue today. Uh, that's what we all came to work to this morning um, with somebody trolling us. And the uh, last thing I want is for the troll to know who this gentleman is or any of that stuff. So keep a lid on it. Um, we've got a long list of questions, many of which you guys uh, gave us in the chat room on Friday, and a bunch of stuff that he sent me. So we're going to have to uh, go rather quickly, uh, which is tough because this gentleman is very articulate and really knows his subject matter. So 
Um, I may have to like, come on, we got to on to the next one. Um, by the way, speaking of Australia, I see Darren Moss talking about uh, Australia. Uh, we have like four or five people from Australia joined taxi in the middle of the night for us last night. So hello, Aussies. Uh, all right. I'm going to call this gentleman now and see if I, for the next uh, 85 minutes, I can go without mentioning his name. Keypad, there we go. Hello there, mystery music library owner. How are you? <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you have no idea how glad you are to be masked today. We uh, had somebody trolling us this morning that was a handful, so I'm glad that he will not know who you are. Oh, my God. Yeah. Trolling you guys? Yeah, just uh, he got a critique he didn't like and posted it... Uh, on our Facebook page, and then we came to find out that he actually uh, edited the critique. Um, so it wasn't the actual critique he got. Some of the stuff on there was from the actual critique. But yeah, when people start modifying those documents and putting them up there going, see, this is what I got, you got to wonder. Anyway, let's move, right. yeah, let's move on to the good stuff. Thank you for taking the time. I know how incredibly busy you are. Um, and I really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to help educate the folks watching the show today. It looks like we have a pretty full house. A lot of my uh, favorite taxi TV people are in the chat room, so glad that uh, they're going to learn from you today. So let's just jump right into it. You know, I was so tempted to get like one of those voice uh, <laughs> things that was, would mask, mess me all up, make me sound like Darth Vader. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we could come up with software to do that. Absolutely. Uh, you just got a little quiet. Are you still the same distance from your phone? I am. I oh. am. All right. Um, can you guys hear the mystery man okay? I'm waiting because there's a little lag in the chat room. No worries. No worries. We're at least so, uh, uh, being safe and socially di distancing. We are. All right. Everybody says sounds good. Great. Yay. All right. Yeah. Lots of people saying they can hear you well. Um, and okay. So the first question was from Robert Valacourse. This is from last Friday's chat. Uh, and he says, what makes you want to pull your hair out with when dealing with submissions, assuming you have hair? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've definitely lost some hair over the years. Um, let's see, what makes me pull my hair out? Well, there's a laundry list of things that make me pull my hair out. Um, let's see. Uh one, I guess the most important thing is, is that people who are submitting know what they're submitting, know that their music is clear of any encumberments. Um, you know, I, 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 my list could go on and on and on. I mean, uh, I, I get... I get things with no, not from taxi, but I get things with no metadata. Um, I don't know, you know, if I have to go back to an MP3 at a later date, I don't know where it came from. I get uh, we transfer files with no names, no contact information. Uh, and it, it, it becomes daunting to try and track it back down at a later date. That's, that's one of the many things. Um, I also have people that, I deal with that, that unfortunately don't really understand the business, meaning they don't understand their own rights and what rights they have in their music. Right. And they may or may not have talked with their co-writers about the fact that they're submitting a piece of music. 
Um, I can't tell you how many times I, I'll go down the, the path of, oh, this is great. Yeah, we'd love to add this, only to find out there was a co-rider. And then when you get into the weeds with the agreements, for whatever reason, the co-rider doesn't want to move forward or, oh, I, I wanted to do something different. And so there's, you know, I would encourage riders to get a lot of this worked out before the fact. Yeah, and we're going to actually touch on that stuff. It's either in your your notes to me or other questions that are maybe a little uh, more specific. This was a pretty broad question, so let's uh, keep going. Well, it, is, it is a broad question, and it's a good one, and I, I could really probably write a book on it. Yeah, you um, should, actually. You know, it's, it's, it's multiple things. I mean, you and I have had so many conversations, Michael. I mean, it's, you know, it's... It could be the kind of thing where uh, it's it's things like uh, using acronyms for a title right. uh, as opposed to what a title actually is. Do you know? So, you know, it, it could be as simple as that. It's like if, if your song is called I Love You Today, don't send me a file that says I-L-Y-T. Um, remember the cream song S W A B L R speaking of songs with acronyms. I don't remember that. Song. All right. Well, there was a song, I think it was on cream's first or second record and it was like swabbler or something. And I actually asked Eric Clapton what, to, what that meant. And he looked at me like, how could you not know? And he said, she was like a beaded rainbow. It's like, how, <laughs> how the hell would I ever know that? But, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I'd be curious. Uh, well, okay, so I'd be curious. How was that registered? Yeah, I have no idea. Right? Yeah. Yep. Well, and I'll get, I'll get things from, from writers that uh, uh, are fantastic songs, and, and it'll be titled One Way Coming to Me, and we do a lot of due diligence here, so we check things, um, meaning that if I get something and we're going to sign it, I check to see if it's already been registered. If it has, who it was registered with? I'll check out. Oh, look at that! It's you know, instead of "I love you today," it's just "I love today." So, uh, one digit off makes it completely a, a challenge, and those are things that have to be cleaned up, unfortunately, at a later date. And that does eat up, dare I say, a lot of our time. Well, I know you guys are particularly. Uh really really good at doing your due diligence better than other libraries that i know so yeah um if, to do it right takes time clearly it, it definitely does it definitely does i mean you know we like to see if something was already registered i can't tell you how many times people send us music only to find out oh it's already been registered it's signed to another publisher um it's encumbered Meaning, you know, I mean, we're an exclusive catalog, so that means we can't move forward with that piece of music, unfortunately. And and some writers, we have writers. Another thing that I'll pull my hair out: somebody signed uh, 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 something with CD Baby, and inadvertently checked the box that's got CD Baby uh, listed as the publisher. So you go to BMI or ASCAP, and you find out, oh, this song's already got CD Baby listed as the publisher, and then you have to unwind that. And right. many times writers want to realize that they even cross that box. Yeah, and it's not just CD Baby. It's TuneCore, it's DistroKid, any of those services that offer any sort of admin deal or publishing deal. And people see that sentence that says, would you like us to help you monetize your music? Oh, sure. They check the box. They don't realize they've entered into a publishing agreement. We talk about that all the time on this show. It's it's very important. I mean, I wish in my perfect world, Michael, that you know everybody had a the opportunity and the the income and the time to go take publishing one hundred and one courses. Um, that would certainly make my life a lot easier. Um, and then business could just run as most businesses run. You know what what you got is a lot of very talented people out there that unfortunately the business side of things is challenging for them and i mean that's why publishers exist but it it can create a lot of roadblocks to moving forward and actually doing business so the more you know about the business you're in the better off you're going to be 
to to move things through, to not to not hit roadblocks with supervisors or with publishers uh, or with networks. Right. Um, I hear about this problem probably three or four times every week of my life now. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't that big a deal, didn't hear about it, but so many people are putting their music online. I understand that. They want a, a digital distributor. I certainly understand that, but they've got to know what they're signing, which is something that you mentioned in your notes to me. If you don't understand what you're signing, don't sign. Have an attorney review anything you're unsure of. So, Well, it, it's, it's a huge thing. And I know everybody doesn't have the capital or the assets to hire an attorney at $400, $500 an hour. Um, you don't need to necessarily have an attorney. I mean, there's so much information that's available out there um, for free, um, free college courses, free uh, uh, blogs. I mean, you, you just have to be careful where you're getting your information from. But, you, you know, Taxi has a forum, too, that I've never been on, but I, I, I know that people go to it to check and verify. And I would highly recommend if you're members to be doing that. Absolutely. And, and you know, the taxi form is great because you can get two or three or five opinions on something like that. Should I sign this deal? And they can do it without mentioning the company. They could just, you know, quote some, uh, particulars from the clauses and say, you know, is this typical? Is this kosher? Is this something that you guys would typically sign? I agree with you. Anybody who doesn't know uh, should hire an attorney, but you're right. It can be four or 500 bucks an hour. And, and you know what? Some of our members have already used the attorneys and know the answers because they've actually forked out the money to hire an attorney. So yeah, it, it's secondhand information, but it's really good secondhand information. Well, and, and I've spoken to, as you know, attorneys that don't agree. I mean, it's just like uh, health experts. I mean, one, one, one doctor could tell you you need a cast, and another doctor says, no, it's just a sprain. I mean, um, you know, you want to kind of do your due diligence. And writers need to know where they're going to draw the line in the sand as far as what rights they're willing to give up or sign away. I mean, different writers – feel differently about those sorts of things. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm an exclusive catalog. Some people just cannot get behind doing an exclusive agreement. You know, I've been in business for 30 plus years. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people that are into exclusive agreements. That being said, it's not for everybody it's just like when you go into if you don't don't go into a mexican restaurant if you don't want mexican food don't go into uh <laughs> you know it's like you you have to know what you want where you're going what your intentions are with your music i mean i get being creative and i'm i'm a creator myself i've all i've done is music my entire life i encourage being creative but there is this business side once you engage in the business side um things get a little bit more difficult. And, the good uh, news is that so much of what you learn in one instance will be applicable to other instances. So after oh, a while, you build up your own little, you know, mental catalog of do's and don'ts on the business side, and it becomes pretty routine, I would think. Well, I would like to think. Um, and the reason I do this, you know, these programs with you and why I've done you know, rallies with you is, you know, at this point in my career, anything I can pass on information wise, that's going to help. I'm, I'm more than happy to, you know, to do that. That being said, you know, I have my biases as well. You know, I'm a big advocate of copyright and a lot of people these days aren't. And so you have to, you know, pick your battles and know who you're going with and you have to go with who you feel comfortable with. And, you know, the people that have been with Taxi for years and years and years, and you and I both know who they are, those people have figured it out, you know, and they, they, they know how to navigate pretty much all the different, you know, yeah. offerings that people have, whether it be exclusive, non-exclusive, they know what it means, 
And if they sign a non-exclusive uh, agreement with a, that company, they know what the the pluses and minuses are. And if they sign an exclusive deal with me, same thing. They know the pluses and minuses. And and for every decision you make, there's going to be pluses and minuses. While we're on the subject of uh, exclusive and non-exclusive, um, you and I were talking the other day about keeping track of your stuff because you've had instances in, in your professional life as a music library owner and CEO where people have submitted material to you, totally forgetting that they had submitted to, submitted it to somebody else and signed a deal in the past, and they totally forgot. So I want to take this opportunity to mention Composer Catalog. For those of you who are unaware of it, it's software that's inexpensive, composercatalog.com. It was built by a composer, one of our longtime members, Keith LeBrant, who's a programmer, built it. Many of our members use it. So for those of you who are new to the show or new to Taxi, don't know about it, pick up Composer Catalog. You can actually download a fully working copy of it. And it keeps track of everything you've got in your catalog, where you've pitched it, where you've signed it, exclusive, non-exclusive, all those pertinent details um, so that you don't make those mistakes. Because how much does that come back to bite you on the butt, um, uh, mystery man? <laughs> I almost called you your name. Well, well, you know, it. it thankfully, again, in, in 30 plus years, that hasn't um, bit me in a way that was business adverse, thankfully. Um, again, after 30 some years, I've got you know, goodwill in the industry. People know who we are. And, um, you know, people screw up. I mean, humans are humans and mistakes happen. Um, what happens is, is I, I just get down and honest. And if, if that happens with a writer, I'll, I'll confront them and just say, Hey, you know, what happened? And then, you know, I'll get I'll get word on what happened, and then it's a matter of cleaning up the mess, which means that I have to go to either the the supervisor, maybe all of these people, the supervisor, the network, um, because it involves cue sheets, it involves registrations, it involves copyright, it involves you know publishing, it involves you know getting to the other catalog, making sure that they remove that piece of music from their catalog, um, it, it eats up quite a bit of time, unfortunately. Um, so the less mistakes, the better. Um, but, you know, you and I have talked about a multitude of things I've had to clean up. And this last year has been uh, unbelievably endless with stuff. Um, and it's largely it's it's human error it's not because anybody was doing anything that i want to say was intentionally illicit it was just people are trying to do a lot and, and mistakes happen right uh you know thankfully uh you know it doesn't get to the level of legality where there's a lawsuit no when but it, it gets could, that when it, it gets that far then it's really going to get ugly and you know I'll be fine because I've been indemnified by the writers in my agreements. But writers, this is where writers need to know what they're signing and they should be keeping track of where they're signing things and, and who has what for, for how long. And, uh, those are important things. I mean, it, it doesn't, I mean, a, a software could be as simple as a word document. It could be a, an Excel sheet that has a song title, um, it has the writer's information. This is the other thing. You guys need to know, oh, my co-writer has 50%. No, my co-writer has 10%. No, my co-writer has whatever that percentage is. That's stuff that should be agreed before music starts getting pitched, long before it gets pitched. Right. And I've had to clean that up. Well, he only, he only wrote the, the title of the tune. And I go, well... You know, old school publishers would look at that completely different than what's going on now. But it really, it just comes down to an agreement between writers. And writers sometimes get uncomfortable talking to their co-writers about the business side of things. Hey, you get this much percentage of this. Um, you know, I kind of, 
again, I'm kind of old school. I like the Lennon McCartney style, where just it was Lennon McCartney. If Paul wrote it, it was Lennon McCartney. If John wrote it, it was Lennon McCartney. Right. And it kept things simple, and I don't think either of them were harmed by that. Yeah, definitely not. Um, not until Yoko showed up, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there was my one decent joke all day. So let's talk about metadata for a minute. Um, sure. You and I were talking the other day about um, people doing something like leaving a comma out or an apostrophe or a period or a digit. Just the tiniest little thing can make a world of difference about finding you, um, find, finding their music being found, their music being registered properly, their name making it to the all-important cue sheet so they get paid. Fill them in about, uh, back me up on that. <laughs> Well, yeah, so it is absolutely true. So every digit, every letter, every comma, dash, everything matters. Um, and I've, I've said to many writers, think of it as a credit card. Uh, it's credit card information. One digit off and your transaction doesn't happen. You don't get whatever the heck you were buying. Um, it doesn't go through. It doesn't get to your – imagine your bank statement. If, if you were putting deposits of money – and your, your, your account number was off by one digit. That money doesn't go into your account. And this is the same thing that happens when it comes to song titles, when it comes to authorship, writers. Um, I mean, there are a lot of writers with PKAs, you know, professionally known as, which is fine, but I, I try and encourage people, you know, know, know who you are professionally and stick with it. Don't don't be changing things, adding a period here, adding a dash there um, that maybe wasn't in a prior version of right. something that that you released. Try and, and and decide who you are, how you want to be known professionally out in the industry, and and don't change it. Or if you do, make sure everybody out there knows that it got changed because otherwise. You're losing money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's easy to forget that stuff. Look, I don't remember when I signed my name, like on a tax return, did I do it with my middle initial or did I not? Um, you know, what's on my driver's license? What's on my passport? We all forget that stuff. So if you want to get paid, be really careful to make sure that there's consistency there. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, John is not Jonathan. Um, right. you know, uh, Robert and Bob and, you know, I mean, there's just so many variations on a theme and, and it's fine. It's fine to have nicknames. It's fine to, to shorten things. Just make sure that's clear with, with your PRO, make sure it's clear with your publisher. I mean, you know, with all of my agreements, when I, when I'm, talking to a writer we're emailing back and forth they may be calling themselves john but when then i dig deeper and go how are you listed with your pro and they may say jonathan which there's you know a yeah. handful of ways of spelling jonathan so then i need to know how do you spell that and if you know if the more you assume the more chances there's going to be error and you're going to lose money so Try and try and dot your I's and cross your T's. I mean, I know it's it's just one more thing to think about, but if you're in the business to make a buck, uh, you could be losing money if you don't. Um, also, you mentioned that you like having stuff like the the BPM, the key of the song, the time signature in the metadata. Um, are there really times where you do an internal search by time signature? I guess like it, maybe you're looking for a waltz thing and you go look, you know, you search up three, four times. Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. Good to know. Absolutely. I'll, I'll have, I'll have emails from supervisors saying I need something between 105 and 110 BPM because it's a dance scene. They already cut the scene to this track and the track will be somewhere in that BPM range. And they're needing to replace it because it didn't get cleared through the clearance department. Um, and they're looking to replace it. 
Um, give me an example of why you would need the key of the song to be in the metadata. Well, uh, similar thing. Uh, somebody's singing. Somebody's singing or somebody's uh, 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 humming along. Uh, oh, there's a, there's on a, screen. There's a, there's, a, there's a million reasons for it. it. It could even be it works well in a transition from the underscore and they're looking for a song that does a nice transition, so they want it in C minor. Wow, great example. Um, okay, now let's talk about... Uh, ex- well, and, and Michael, and one other thing. Yeah. I mean, it's important for writers, for everybody in the music business, if you're, if you're writing music, it, it doesn't hurt to know the beats per minute, and it doesn't hurt to know key signatures. That's, that's, that's you know basic music knowledge um and you know knowledge is power and the more people know about the business they're in the better absolutely um one of the things we talked about the other day was using services there are several good services out there now where somebody's a songwriter let's say i'm a songwriter and i do an acoustic song called i love you deb uh, and I want to add a full band and a real vocalist to it, so I send my song out to one of those services, and they do a great job of producing it to for me, and I get, get it back in my hands, and I start submitting it through Taxi or through other means, and uh, now it ends up going to a library, and let's say that the library's not as buttoned up as you are. Um, and they don't do their due diligence very well, and that song gets forwarded to a slot on a major motion picture and ends up in a Hollywood blockbuster movie, and now they come to find out that the singer who sang on the track or the bass player or the drummer or keyboardist, whatever, um, that those people haven't signed a work-for-hire agreement with that service. How bad can that be? Well... Um, bad, how bad could it be? Worst case scenario is there's a lawsuit. That's, that's, I would have to say that would be the worst case scenario. And where, yeah, let's use your, your analogy. It goes into a major motion picture. And I mean, major, let's say, you know, mission impossible or something at that level. And then uh, what would most likely happen is, is that singer reaches out to the production company and raises a flag and says, hey, that's me singing on it. You know, I didn't sign that away. And then it, the production company is going to reach out to the supervisor who's going to reach out to wherever they got the piece of music from. And you're going to have a lot of very powerful people, very angry, and uh, and when you're talking a motion picture at that level with that amount of money behind it, um, that's some scary stuff. And you can believe that they have an army of attorneys um, right. that are going to come after you. Uh, and so what kind of trouble can you get into if they come after you? Um, and, and again, assuming that they've held you harmless in the deal as a library owner, um, and, and well, that means well, they they would har- they would hold well they they would hold me harmless from a legal standpoint right because I you know my agreements indemnify that the who I'm doing agreement with that person has or that group of people has the 100 percent right to enter into the agreement if they don't have something in writing from that vocalist then they didn't have the right to enter into the agreement in the first place. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Because that singer on that master, maybe they didn't write anything, um, but as the singer of the song, they actually become part owner and the master. Wow. I know that sir, uh, there's one service I'm actually uh, good friends with the owner. It's called StudioPros.com, and I believe 
that they've got that in their deal that all the people who work on their stuff are, are actually hired as work for hire. I'm not sure that that's true for other services out there. So I would caution everybody, if you're using an outsourced uh, production service, the, one of the first things you should ask them is, are your people hired as work for hires? And do you have documentation on that? And you would want to see copies of that so that you've got it in your file for that song if you're going to submit it and uh, you know have it land in a major anything i mean even you know a weekly episodic tv show it doesn't have to be going into a tom cruise blockbuster well exactly and you know i've dealt with this as you might imagine uh in a myriad of ways and i won't put something like that in my catalog there's no way i'll do it until the writer gets that cleaned up, meaning that if the writer can actually get in touch with the singer and, and I mean, look, I think these services are, are legit and I'm sure they're, they're coming from a very clean place. It's just that all it takes is one. And would I be sued as a library? No, but what I, what would probably happen is I'd be blacklisted. Meaning right. they would go, Oh, I can't trust X because we just got effed up. Yeah, and not only does that burn you from that relationship, it may cause other relationships to fall by the wayside because word travels pretty quickly in, in our little corner of the industry. Um, so not only does it affect your income and your ability to do business, but it affects all the other musicians who are also in your catalog. So that one little mistake can rain down on a lot of heads. Well, it, it can. And my catalog in particular is very big about um, building uh, the artists I represent, building their names out in the community with the people, my, my, my clients. And so I push my writers. I push them, you know. And so if it blows up and your name happens to be on that, um, that could also bode very poorly for you, no matter what catalog you're in going forward. Uh, a similar thing would be true for co-writers. Um, and, and I've seen examples of people that have tried to hide it when, let's say the Manny Mo and Jack are all co-writers on a song. Um, they were best friends when they were in their 20s, and now Manny is, uh, you know, has the music. On his computer, he joins Taxi, submits the music, we forward it to your library, um, you do your due diligence, and Manny says, uh, oh yeah, it's just me and Mo, we're the writers on it, because he knows that he hasn't been in touch with Jack for 25 years, and he heard that Jack may have passed away or moved to another country, so they just don't mention the fact that Jack was a writer on that. Is that a similar, you know, near catastrophic or maybe truly catastrophic mistake? Not really with the scenario you, you mentioned. I mean... Well, give me one that would be. Well, I mean, look, if, the, if, if writer number three passed away, um, I mean, you know, I would go down the rabbit hole because that's what we do here. I mean, if it's a, a song that's 20 years old, you know, you go back, most likely somebody registered it or it was released somewhere. Um, so I'd go digging and I'd, I'd most likely find that third writer and then I'd bring their attention to it. Hey, why didn't you mention this person? And then I'd get whatever story I would get. Um, you know, there's been music I've turned away. Because, I can't tell you, great music. Yeah. Some fantastic music, but because I can't get to the bottom of ownership and 100% control, I have to walk away. And it's, it's, there's nothing worse when you're hearing a great song and you're going, oh my God, this is ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching for years to come. And you can't put, I can't put it in my catalog because I can't dot my I's and cross my T's. I can't verify that, that this particular track is unencumbered. Now, if somebody lies to me, I mean, look, you know, that's not so good. 
I no. mean, especially if they put it in a contract. I mean, I've had managers reach out to me on behalf of writers that they supposedly represent. I've had managers forge signatures. Um, they wow. happen to know the social security numbers of their writers. Um, and I've had writers call me after the fact, this is why I'm so due dil- I do so much due diligence, call me later and go, Hey, you know, how did you place that in the spin? And I'll go, well, because I have an agreement signed by you with this. And they'll go, I didn't sign that. <laughs> so, I mean, are there liars? Are there people out there that do bad business? Yes. Um, can it be cleaned up? Yes. Can you be sued? Yes. Um, this is why uh, we publishers, uh, you know, we have to try and do very, very clean business and try and work with people that are reputable. And um, as you know, I'm very about that. Yes, you are. Yeah, very you're, about uh, that. Uh, and uh, once sp- you're on the end with me, and I know that we're doing clean business, we're golden. Except for the occasional mistake, but we won't tell that story. Um, yeah, well, again, you know. It was an honest mistake. It's it, honest mistake. You know, could it have been bad? Yeah, could have been very, very bad. Um, but this is where, I mean, really, really keeping track of, of what you're doing I mean, I, I deal with a lot of writers that write with a lot of co-writers, and that's fine. Just keep track of who it is. And if you're sending your music out to five different publishers, know who they were that you sent it to. And if you sign with one of them, make sure you put that somewhere in an Excel or in the software that you're describing. Somewhere. Write it down. Sign, you know, I love you, Deborah, to whatever the catalog is you know if there's a reversion clause on the catalog if it's a five-year reversion make sure you write that down and what the date would be as much information as you can keep on because these are assets these songs are assets this is you know it can be money in the bank which is you know what you've been preaching for years yeah monetize your music absolutely um, let's but go. there's the other side of it, which is a lawsuit, and a minimum copyright infringement lawsuit. I think these days is starting at about fifty grand. Not to mention the legal fees. Um, well, that that can be daunting as well. 